much. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm very honored to speak about continuous manufacturing for drug substance. I have spent a large part of my career um, working on complex APIs and drug substance, considering how they are developed and how they are manufactured to meet the pull of patients. So novel methodologies like continuous manufacturing can help us meet that pull. Uh, for this presentation today, I'm looking forward to leaving you with these learning objectives. The first is to be able to cite the unique challenges for continuous manufacturing of drug substance. Second, to be able to identify ways to systematically understand your continuous drug substance process. And third, to develop ways to demonstrate process robustness. So the emerging technology team has received more and more requests to discuss continuous manufacturing of drug substance, particularly for small molecules, which can then become NDA submissions or ANDA submissions. Continuous manufacturing itself, that's something that Arwa was talking about. It has two very major components, the manufacturing and the controls that support that manufacturing. So for manufacturing, we can be talking about which unit operations are going to be continuous. What are the critical data, it's really up to you, it's up to you and your company. But there have been some unifying questions and concerns that we've observed on our end that could be answered if you ask yourself two very simple questions about your continuous drug substance process. And I can't tell you what those questions are until I can go to the next slide. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you. And those two questions are, can you walk the process? And did you lock the process? So I very intentionally made walk and lock kind of rhyming so that it can really lodge into your mind. But let me tell you what I mean by each of these. Let's start with walk the process. So there's obviously a lot going on in continuous drug substance manufacturing. We've got the chemistry. We've got to balance the manufacturing and the controls. But it's important to be able to very systematically understand what is happening in your process. So just imagine that someone from the FDA, maybe a senior manufacturing assessor like me, is walking beside you at your manufacturing facility. Would you be able to point out what is happening when and explain why? So to walk the process, um, we can do that by first being able to track our reaction material. So where is that reaction occurring? Where does that reaction material go? If it's being held somewhere, is the reaction quenched or is it continuing? That sort of thing. Next, we need to consider all the routes that our material can take. So this is the expected route or the good route. Um, there's also alternative routes. 
say that there's a deviation or a nonconformance, where does that bad material go? And then finally, to walk the process, we want to start to build that paper trail. So um, it's not a real process unless it's written down. And um, that's a great way to do it through batch records, process development, et cetera. Oh, I lost it again. Oh, OK. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> All right, so um, the best way to walk the process, let's look at a case study together. It's a, oops, it's a very simple case study. Um, we have two starting materials that are reacted in reaction one. The outputs of that go towards an in-process control point and then continue on to reaction two. The outputs of reaction two become our final drug substance. So what makes this continuous is there's a continuous input of starting materials. So we have cycle one, which is in green. And then directly behind it comes cycle two in orange. So at any given time, when the equipment is at a state of control, all the equipment is in use, there may be multiple cycles that are being run through the system. If we begin our walk, we start at our first stop, which is reaction one. And here, we're going to again think about those three components of walking the process. We want to track the reaction material. We want to consider all the routes the material will take. And we'll start to build our paper trail. So we obviously uh, need to know what reaction conditions are necessary for reaction one to get us towards uh, closer to our final drug substance. And we want to consider the critical process parameters that support those reaction conditions. Since we're beginning our continuous manufacturing, we can also think about what startup procedures are necessary. So how do we get all our equipment into a state of control? And we can record those startup procedures in standard operating procedures. We can have our CPPs and our reaction conditions and our development reports, um, that sort of thing. If we move on to our next step, which is that in-process control point, we can start to see the interaction of multiple cycles. So as cycle one in green is tested at the in-process control point and heads towards reaction two, we can ask ourselves, is there any delay in getting those results from that in-process control that may change our manufacturing decisions? So for example, um, if cycle one was found to fail at that in-process control point, is there a way to divert it away from reaction two, and how do we remove that non-conforming material from cycle two so it doesn't impact it? Diversion of material can be accounted for in equipment schematics. You can do calculations to prove that you have removed any non-conforming material. And for the in-process controls, you can use run charts to show um, any trending from one cycle to the next especially if you're using a process analytical technology. We continue on to our last stop, which is reaction two. We're going to again think about those reaction conditions, those critical process parameters that support those reaction conditions. But now we can think about our definition of a drug substance batch. Is that equivalent to one uh, continuous cycle, multiple continuous cycles? Is it the amount of time that we are collecting cycles? However you define it, it's important to be able to trace back to the genealogy of that drug substance batch. So what individual cycles comprise it, even what individual starting material lots comprise it. Just as we thought about startup of continuous manufacturing, we can think about shutdown. We can think about pausing and restarting. And having very meaningful, detailed enough batch records is incredibly important so everyone's on the same page during manufacturing. So overall, by walking the process, we have a better systematic understanding of our continuous drug substance process. We may implement flow meters to track our critical process parameters or adjust the schematics of our equipment so we have delay loops, so we have time to make 
manufacturing decisions. We can even define our drug substance batch. So we've come quite a far away from that very simple diagram we had before. And now we're ready to actually lock the process. So what this means is uh, we first want to confirm that our process is robust or consistent. There should be only one key that fits in that lock. And we can do that um, by doing process performance qualification, or PPQ. So in PPQ, you are taking your extent, extensive development and manufacturing experiences, and you are defining a study to prove that you know what your process is, that it operates in the way you expect it, and that you can track it in, in that way. In order to lock your process, you can also fully investigate and correct any deviations. So you're removing any wiggle in your process. This can be done by doing a very thorough root cause analysis, which feeds into your corrective and preventative action program. So um, typically, the easiest solution to implement may not address the deviation fully. Um, but doing a very thoughtful root cause analysis will help you identify the best solution or solutions for your process. So let's go through a case study together. Um, it's the same process we were working with before. And the company that was using this process decided, you know, they had enough development and manufacturing experience that they wanted to do three PPQ batches where each PPQ batch is equivalent to 10 uh, continuous cycles. So while they were doing process performance qualification, they identify a buildup issue occurring in reaction one. And as a result, um, those uh, continuous cycles were going straight to waste. Um, but you know, they continued to manufacture until they got 10 good cycles that comprised a PPQ batch. And it obviously you know, passed the release specification. And the question here is, did the company, is their process locked? So did they demonstrate that their process is locked? What do you guys think? No, correct. OK, very easy, right? Um, but there's obviously a deviation here. They haven't addressed it. They haven't done a root cause analysis. They, you know, they haven't monitored their solutions that they implemented. And even though their PPQ batches passed at release, there's obviously some wiggle, some variation in their manufacturing itself. So it, it, their process is not locked, and there's work that needs to be done before they can say that it is. So uh, suppose they do that root cause analysis. Um, you know, they're very persistent, which is excellent. They do their root cause analysis. Um, they implement solutions. Um, they monitor it. They're confident that it works. Um, and they decide to repeat their PPQ. And in their PPQ report, they have these three parameters that they tested along with these results provided. So uh, for yield for continuous reactor one and reactor two, they decide they're going to hold off during PPQ. They're going to have acceptance criteria based on their commercial batches. And then for their CQAs and CPPs, they note in their PPQ report that their results are conforming. So the question here is, is their process locked? No. <laughs> the brave person in the back was correct. Yes, it is not locked, um, and for a lot of reasons. The first reason is their PPQ, it's an opportunity to really prove they understand their process by having meaningful metrics that they are tracking. And none of these parameters account for their complex, you know, continuous process. For example, cycle times, like how long are they expecting each cycle to take, whatever parameters they use to track startup and shutdown and state of control, they haven't accounted for any of the continuous aspects of their process. Uh, in addition, yield is an excellent way to track batch to batch variability. And even if you have tentative yield limits during PPQ, it's a great way to track what's going on during PPQ. So, um, we highly recommend that you have acceptance criteria there. Um, also, for results like conforms does not conform, it's not very data driven, so it's hard to tell if you're trending or not. So, having you know database meaningful metrics is very important for PPQ. 
So overall, walk and lock, um, it's something I wanted to really have stick in your mind because I, I do think it addresses a lot of the major concerns we've observed so far with continuous manufacturing for drug substance. Um, but I do have other pieces of humble advice that I hope you'll take into account. The first is, and Larry said this also in his presentation, we did not work together on our slides, but um, be transparent. Um, and, you know, what are the things that are keeping your scientists up at night? What's keeping your engineers up at night? When you meet with the emerging technology team, it's far before you even submit an ANDA or an NDA. And this is the opportunity to tell us what you think could go wrong. And then we can start that problem-solving process together. Uh, second, pre-operational visit. So that's what Larry was talking about with the site visit. Um, if you can build time into your project timeline, where before you submit your ANDA or your NDA, the emerging technology team will come to your facility, and we will walk the process right beside you. So we can talk about what gaps we observe. We can continue that problem-solving process. It's a great opportunity, and it doesn't have that stress or that pressure of an actual FDA inspection. Uh, data, data, data. So when you are doing your walking and your locking, please be sure to include data so we can see trending, so we can better understand what's going on. Um, I can't stress that enough. You know, long narratives are not, they should not be standalone. There should be data to back it up. Uh, just as I spoke about before, root cause analysis, being very thorough, having a strong CAFA program, um, that's very important. And uh, finally, be very thoughtful about your process performance qualification. Um, I think of it as a way that you can really show off to us how much you know about your process, um, especially for continuous manufacturing for drug substance. The more you can show off, the better. So. I hope that uh, this has inspired you to pursue drug substance continuous manufacturing. Um, but before I let you guys go, I have two challenge questions that are hope hopefully very, very easy. So challenge question number one, true or false, process development reports, SOPs, and batch records are appropriate mediums to walk through a drug substance continuous manufacturing process with the emerging technology team or within an application? True. Yes, these are excellent mediums to use, especially for an application. Please use them. Challenge question number two, true or false? When discussing continuous manufacturing of drug substance with the emerging technology team, your manufacturing process should be locked. False. That's correct. Um, it's very early on.